Welcome back everybody, you're here with Matt and James and today we have a very exciting guest, we're speaking on anxiety and worry in tough times. That's right. I'm really excited to introduce you today, uh, Dr. Mary Miller, who's with us. So welcome, Mary. Hi, James. Hi, Matt. And Dr. Mary Miller is a, is a great uh, colleague and friend of um, myself. Um, and uh, it's, it's just a, an honor to have her along uh, with us today. Um, one, because um, I've known her for a while now, and she's not only been a good friend, she's an excellent clinician. She, has, um, she works in private clinician mind therapy up in Auckland. Um, she's got a background in child and adolescent mental health, as well as uh, uh, eating disorders clinic and um, some lecturing and, and a university as well. Um, in addition to a broad range of experiences um, before that as well. So she's just one of my favorite people and I'm just um, so stoked that she can come along and talk to us today. So good to have you here. Thanks James, that's a really lovely introduction. Really nice to be here with you guys today um, talking a bit about anxiety and worry and how that might be affecting people at the moment. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So well, let's, let's jump onto that because really uh, during this time, it, it, there's lots of new things that it's going to be happening for people and a lot of um, new challenges and new expectations and, and new things that kind of can impact on their emotional state. And obviously one of the, the kind of one that's been um, really prominent at the moment is anxiety. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about from your experience, um, uh, you know, about anxiety and, and how people are managing and maybe what that is from your perception? Yeah, sure. And I think it's useful to acknowledge that at the moment, it is an unusual time. You know, the COVID-19 pandemic is unlikely to be a kind of thing that most of us have experienced before in our lifetime. But actually, most of us have felt anxious or worried before. Um, so while it's different, there are also experiences from our own, own past that we can draw on that can be really helpful. Um, so one of the things to remember is that while this might be an unusual time for us, Actually, we have felt worried before, we have felt anxious before, and that's a normal part of being a human, right? Um, things happen in life, anxiety shows up, we have worrying thoughts about things, and, and that that's okay right now. That if we weren't having that response, it would actually, that would be unusual. Yeah, absolutely. You'd have to either be like perfectly enlightened um, or <laughs> something something's not going wrong maybe, maybe you're just living in the cave not not knowing what's going on but it, it's totally normal to to have some sort of anxiety uncertainty during this time yeah, yeah that's right and also to remember that anxiety has a function for us you know if we didn't have a level of anxiety people wouldn't be complying with lockdown orders you know we wouldn't be washing our hands um and also in other ways we wouldn't you know, stop to check before we cross the road or study for an exam. So sometimes there's an idea that anxiety is a kind of a bad or a dangerous thing in our life. But actually, if we didn't have anxiety, it would be really unsafe for us. And so sometimes seeing anxiety in that way, that maybe it's helpful in some way, maybe it's a normal kind of response, um, can be useful. Mary, you're talking uh, about anxiety Another word that was popping up in my head as you were saying some of those examples was being cautious. What's the difference between being cautious or being worried and anxiety? Yeah, and you're right. I mean, I think that um, often today, you know, those kind of words are used interchangeably. Um, it's not always quite clear what we're kind of referring to, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I guess there's a natural kind of anxiety response that we might get um, when we face a dangerous or even an unknown situation. So yeah, that might lead to us then behaving in a cautious manner. We might, um, might evaluate the situation. We might have thoughts about um, what's happening and maybe start problem solving how we can kind of cope with that. And sometimes that's how worry shows up, that it's this way of thinking through problems and things that are happening to us. Anxiety normally kind of refers more to um, our kind of physiological response, if you like. Um, so that's really when um, 
when our fight, flight or freeze um, uh, response gets triggered. Uh, we have a flood of different kind of hormonal responses that change our breathing and our heart rate. We may have symptoms like feeling kind of sweaty or slightly sick. And this is a kind of anxiety response. Mm. So where does, worry, where does worry fit in? So it sounds like anxiety might be one side of the coin. Is, what's the other side? Is it worry? Is it... <laughs> I think we can try and draw like a hard line between anxiety and worry in terms of worry referring more to kind of thinking styles and anxiety more to a kind of um, physiological response. But in reality, most people have both of those things going on for them. So while there is a distinction, I'm not sure for most people when they're feeling worried or anxious, if it's that helpful, the distinction to make. Yeah, and that's a really good point um, to make is that, you know, there's so much overlap. And, and I'd also even um, bridge that overlap further with low mood that, you know, for many of us, um, that, that struggle with things like anxiety, anxiety can look a little bit different. And that might be irritability, frustration, um, sleeping difficulties, but it also could be um, uh, impacting on our mood and feeling low and, and um, you know, un apathetic and those sorts of things. There's lots of overlap there, isn't there? Yeah, that's totally right. And I think that, you know, as humans, we're kind of complicated. It depends what's happening around us in our environment what's happening with people that we have close relations to, um, and also drawing on our previous experience, if we've been particularly anxious or if we've had low mood before in the past. Um, so I think that sometimes it can be really useful, first of all, to really get to know and understand our own responses. You mm. know, how do we feel when we're anxious? What do we think about when we're worrying? Yeah. And there can be a tendency when anxiety shows up that it feels really unpleasant, right? It's not a nice sensation. And so we want to kind of get away from that. And that makes a lot of sense. But sometimes this kind of um, desire to have no anxiety means that the anxiety kind of rebounds even more strongly. And we can end up in this tug of war kind of situation where we want to kind of reduce our anxiety and get away from it. And then it's like the volume gets turned up and we feel the symptoms even more strongly. So I think one of the first ways of kind of responding to anxiety is actually just to stop and tune in to how we feel anxiety. What happens for us? What happens to our mind? What thoughts do we have? What happens in our body? Are we experiencing some of those anxiety symptoms of increased heart rate or changes in our breathing? You know, maybe on a physical realm, it also, like James was saying, turns up as, you know, difficulty sleeping or um, a reduction in appetite. Um, and we also might find that it changes how we act. You know, when we're feeling anxious, do we withdraw from other people? Do we want to do less things? So anxiety can look different for different people and in different situations. So one useful way to start is by getting used to, well, what happens for us when we're feeling anxious or worried? Great. And, and I want to actually hear a, a bit more about maybe a couple of other tips for managing this. But um, drawing back on that, that point that you just mentioned um, about um, you know, how it impacts us and um, how we engage with our anxiety, um, because sometimes our emotions about our emotions end up being the bigger problem, don't they? We start off with having anxiety and then we start to have um, thoughts of, oh, maybe I'm not coping with COVID um, like others. You know, we're scrolling through Instagram and people seem to be amazing parents doing all these, um, you know, crafts and, and things like this. Or maybe they're doing all these chores and we feel like, oh, I've got to, I've got to do this or I'm not doing this in the same way or doing this. I'm not being creative enough or the right sort of parent or husband or wife or whatever. And suddenly we get anxious about our anxious, which makes us get frustrated about ourselves or guilty. And suddenly we're, we're adding suffering to the initial suffering. I mean, yeah, that's right. I kind of think about this in my mind as though we have like a natural level of anxiety, like a natural normal response. And then we have how we respond to that. On it's a layer on top and, and you know we might want to get kind of curious about well how do we respond when anxiety shows up in our life 
And is that a helpful way of responding or does it add to the suffering like you were saying? So sometimes when that natural level shows up, we want to get rid of it. So we might find ourselves trying to numb out that feeling um, that might be through things like Netflix or alcohol or spending time on our phone and um, that we're really finding ways to avoid that natural normal level of anxiety. But when we do that, there's a subtle message that we're sending to ourselves that actually we can't cope with that anxiety feeling and what caused it. Yeah? And so that kind of leads to a drop in our own confidence about us coping with whatever's kind of showing up at that point. Yeah? So sometimes when, when we respond to that natural level by trying to kind of get rid of it, the paradox is that we then actually increase how anxious we feel. Mm. So Mira, you're not saying that um, watching Netflix during COVID is a bad thing. What you're saying is be wary or be aware of the function of watching Netflix. If you're doing it not just to enjoy Netflix um, after the kids have gone to bed, if you're doing it to escape something that you should be doing, is that an indication that maybe the function is unhelpful. Yeah, and I think this is about really tuning in again, right? You know, how do we get anxious and what do we do when we are? And that's right, sometimes we just need a break, right? And so, you know, watching something on TV or kind of mindlessly flicking on our phone, that might be really helpful for a while. But when we really kind of tune in and are honest with ourselves, did it make us feel better? Or did the anxiety then rebound? You know, sometimes you know, that if we have avoided our anxiety all day and then we watch them, you know, Netflix before bed and then we get into bed and suddenly all these worrying thoughts pop up mm. or maybe we wake up at 3 a.m. and our mind is busy worrying. It might be that actually we spent the day kind of avoiding some of those difficult thoughts and feelings. And distraction in that way can be that form of avoidance, can't it? Yeah, yeah, that's right. And so we have to kind of ask ourselves, is this distraction for a little while and that's helpful or is this distraction avoidance and then we're feeling an increase in our distress yeah there's this paradox as us for us as humans where we're, we're we've got this incredible ability to be able to think about the future and in thinking of the future um, we can plan and problem solve and we can um, do all these amazing things um, but we can also get ourselves into trouble and in that we can think about all the, the kind of worst case scenarios, the things that might get us in trouble. And the, the function of that is to, to protect ourselves and to, um, to keep ourselves safe. Um, but it can get us into trouble when we start, often we start thinking about the future as a way to problem solve, but we get in this loop where we're no longer, we, maybe we can't do something about it or we're thinking about hypothetical consequences and suddenly we're, we're in this worry cycle and we're, we're getting caught up. But on the other side of that paradox is that actually as humans, while we can, and, and, you know, in this current situation where we can always imagine a worse scenario, um, we're actually also the most capable and resilient and resourceful, um, I suppose, animals or people um, around. We actually have the ability to, to cope well. And so often in times of anxiety is that we underestimate our ability to cope. Um, for many, we can overestimate the threat. This, for, for many people, it can be this threat is real and there, there's lots of challenges with that, but we so often underestimate our own ability to cope. And that's when we need to be kind and compassionate to ourselves. Yeah, and I think that um, it's a really nice point there about kind of how the mind is trying to help us, right? It's trying to problem solve. And sometimes that can be really useful and we can come up with new ideas or perspective on things. But you're right, it's important to tune into when does problem solving become just going around in circles. You know? So sometimes it's really useful when we're feeling anxious to pay attention maybe to what our mind is saying. You know, and sometimes it can be useful just to listen to how we're talking to ourselves. You know, if we're feeling really anxious about something, you know, does our mind become really critical about the fact that we're anxious? Mm. Um, so one thing that I kind of like to do in this situation is kind of to try and flip the perspective. Like if my friend was feeling really anxious, maybe about COVID-19 or whatever's going on for them, what would I be saying to them? 
you know i'm unlikely to say to them oh i can't believe you're so stupid for worrying you know like what are you doing and you've wasted so much of today you know you're planning to learn japanese and you haven't started at all what's the matter with you you're failing as a person you're a loser you're hopeless you know? and sometimes our mind can be really cruel to ourselves yeah, so it's useful to tune in what is the mind saying and would we dream of saying it like that to someone else Mary, that's a really interesting point. One of the discussions James and I have had uh, on another video is the importance of understanding your internal world. Listen to your mind and, mm -hmm. and um, well, become friends with your mind, really. And that's kind of what you're talking about now. Um, at, talk to yourself as you would talk to a friend. Yeah, that that's right. James is talking about compassion there. You know, so understanding the quality of how we're talking to ourselves in our mind, what our internal kind of dialogue is, and trying to bring in, just as we would do for a friend or a loved one or a child, is to bring in that voice of understanding and reassurance that it's okay to be worried, that that's normal, and that what do we need to do to help and reassure and encourage ourselves when we're in tough times and things are feeling really hard. Mary, you, you've talked about one of the ways um, that we can start to, I suppose, be um, to, to manage this anxiety a little bit differently. And that's first to observe um, this, our response to anxiety. Do you have any other tips that you think would be useful for maybe the people watching this? Um, I, there's many out there. Uh, we could probably spend a whole um, you know, hour talking through many. But if you were just to name a couple, what do you think would be important? Yeah, it's a really good question. And I notice a bit of anxiety come up in terms of how I respond to that. Um, because I think that actually right now we're all just doing our best mm. in a kind of difficult you know, situation. And so I think these kind of tips or suggestions, play around with them, see if they work for you or if they're helpful. And if not, then let them go. Um, so one of the things that can show up for people when they're feeling anxious is that we get this strong kind of physiological response for our anxiety and it kind of peaks like a wave and then gently kind of tapers off. Yeah. But when we're experiencing that, we have changes in our, in our heart rate and especially our breathing. So one of the things that can help with anxiety is to, um, to help that physical response. So these are things like doing kind of breathing exercises that just help slow down the breathing rate. Um, but also some kind of relaxation techniques, um, for instance, around kind of um, tensing and releasing kind of muscle groups to help the body move through that anxiety response and through that kind of tapering off. Yeah, that, that's a couple of good ones. Certainly um, for me, and I know Matt was talking about it at another point as well, is um, where we hold our stress. And, and for me, it's my um, jaw and my 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 uh, brow I, I start to kind of frown a little bit and just kind of checking in with my body and going oh i just need to release my jaw loosen it up in my head it actually sends a signal back to your brain because there's that feedback loop isn't it that with your body and your brain it's sending a signal to your brain to go hey i don't have to be anxious i've got no need to be um well, it's not helpful, maybe it's a better phrase, um, to, to be in this state right now. And by just changing your physical body, it can impact in a way to calm down your mind as well. And yeah, that's right. And I think for a lot of people, it makes sense that if we're um, thinking anxious things, that our body might get tight and tense. But it's not necessarily so intuitive to realise it works the other way around as well that if our body is tight and tense, that actually the mind kind of goes looking for things to be worried about. So that's right. That's why it can be so useful to work on that physical level and um, to help bring the body back into a, um, a more kind of relaxed state. Sometimes I get a little bit of kickback on this um, subject when talking with clients and explaining the science behind and the research behind um, anxiety, physiological responses and the connection with your mind, you know, the mind-body connection. But just to, just to talk to our viewers just really quickly is that there is amazing research out here in this field looking at um, this connection. Um, Robert Sapolsky, he's a neuroendocrinologist, for example. He's one of my favorite scientists on this topic. 
he's got some really great um, research looking at um, anxiety in animals, well, stress responses in animals, and comparing that to humans. And his number one tip for humans dealing with um, stresses um, is to have regular healthy stress management techniques. Number one tip, just find, like you were saying, Mary, finding stuff to do um, that actually works. But sometimes talking with clients and, and, and saying, hey, there's these really great breathing exercises that we can do that's got some great research behind it. Sometimes I get kicked back on that. People don't want to do breathing when they're feeling these things. They say, why would you tell me to breathe? This is stupid. And it can seem a little bit like if you're feeling very, very anxious, that how is that going to help, right? It's like just taking a few breaths. It doesn't help. And back to feeling anxious straight away again. Um, but I think one of the most important things to remember is it's a skill and it's a skill that needs practice just in the same way that if you went to the gym and you started a new exercise, you wouldn't expect it to work amazingly the first time. You know, you might be a bit clumsy, it might feel a bit awkward, you might have really tired, achy muscles afterwards. Um, so something that sometimes shows up for clients if they're feeling really anxious and they're trying to breathe is, the first time they try the breathing skills is when they're already feeling really anxious. And this is a little bit like turning up on the day and expecting yourself to run a marathon. Yeah? We just wouldn't do that, right? We'd, we'd start off running smaller distances over time. Maybe we'd do it with a friend and get some encouragement and slowly we'd build up until we were ready to, you know, to run on that big day. And it's a little bit like that with breathing as well. It's actually most useful to practice the breathing skills when we're already relaxed. Yeah. And this is because it's a new skill. We want to get used to how that feels to change our breathing rhythm and just to develop that ability to focus on the breath. Yeah. And then over time, as we feel more confident with that, then we can move on to using the breath when we feel a bit anxious yeah. and eventually be able to use it when we're experiencing that stronger anxiety. But I think one of the biggest things with this is that don't take my word for it or Matt's word for it or, you know, the fancy research, give it a go. Mm. And maybe it doesn't work for you and that's okay. Maybe there's a different way that's helpful. Um, but, you know, that if it stays as kind of an idea that we're just talking about, it's probably not going to be helpful, right? So I would encourage people, give it a try. And um, also try and find a... Um, maybe a guided technique that can help with, um, with the breathing. Um, and you've got to experiment, find one that works for you. Somebody's, you know, pan pipes is somebody else's torture. So, you know, if you like kind of, you know, running, running water sounds or whale noises, that's great. If that's not your thing, find another way to do it. And on that topic, there's a, look, there's a wide range of resources available on the internet. Um, uh, as you mentioned, Mary, um, but, um, you know, um, you're not always sure what you get. So when I, whenever I'm um, talking to, to clients of myself um, in the past, you know, directing them towards the internet, it's a wide place. Uh, one place I would say is uh, Mary has a couple of really nice resources on mind therapy through Spotify. Is that, that's right. Yeah, that's right. I've started recording a skills series, um, which is a, a, a series of podcasts that are just talking people through kind of skills like breathing and relaxation techniques so that they can follow along at home and you know like I might not be everybody's cup of tea so that's fine give it a go if you find it helpful that's great if not find one that suits you but sometimes it is useful especially when you're starting out to have something that you can follow along to great great Okay, well, there's a, a couple of just fantastic tips in there that we can uh, that we've taken from, that I've taken from them um, too, and uh, you've got a couple more. Tell me about those. So, if you remember back at the beginning, we were talking a little bit about how when anxiety shows up, it can be really tempting to avoid it. Yeah, and that makes sense, right? It doesn't feel nice. We want to get away from it, um, and we want to avoid it. But the subtle message there is that maybe. We can't cope with that and it undermines our confidence. So one of the ways that we can build confidence with anxiety is to turn that around. And that means starting to face some of those fears. And that might mean staying with that feeling of anxiety, or it might be doing things that make us feel a little bit nervous or afraid. And sometimes if you're already feeling anxious, that can maybe sound a bit overwhelming. Um, so what I'd suggest there is break it down into just very small steps. 
the smallest step that you can, where you would be facing something that you've been avoiding that might be increasing that anxiety over time. I suppose when you talk about it, it can almost feel counterintuitive that the one of the ways that we actually deal with anxiety um, and at the root of anxiety is often fear is to face some of those fears. But um, you know, the, the wisdom there is being able to break that down into really small steps, to get advice, um, think about ways you can do that in a manageable way that you can build success um, and to, to kind of and uh, give yourself um, that sense of winning that, hey, I can do this and I am capable. It's kind of like modifying that belief that I, I'm not able to cope. It's actually proving to yourself and, and giving your mind more evidence to, to demonstrate that you have the capacity. And the more evidence you have of capacity, um, the more challenges you're going to be willing to face in the future. Mary, you've got a, such a lovely way of articulating things. Partly it might be your... Uh... Uh, well, definitely your expertise, partly also um, your accent. I think I, I could listen to you speak for a long time. But you've got some really nice tips in there. Um, obviously, through your experience, you've got wisdom and, and that. So really thank you for taking time out today. Oh, thank you. It's been a pleasure to be with you guys today. And, you know, I think that what I notice is talking to you that actually it's really useful to talk about anxiety. Mm. Right? that that's something that can show up that maybe it's embarrassing or that we feel like we should be kind of coping better or not having these anxious thoughts. And so actually part of reducing the avoidance of anxiety sometimes can just be to talk about it, to share with someone else. And then often we find that actually other people are feeling anxious as well. And it can be helpful to understand that it's a normal response and that we all feel that way. Yeah, absolutely. Um, just at, and, and in a time of uh, physical distancing, um, sometimes those social networks are, are limited. But if we've got ways to to touch base with friends and family or people that are meaningful, that are that are um, that are trustworthy, um, and we can be open and honest about some of these feelings that we have, um, you know, it can have a big impact. And um, it, for all of us, none of us are immune to this. Um, so. Again, I just want to reify Matt's comments. Thank you so much. You've got a great way of communicating and, and um, uh, we'll definitely take things on board and we hope that everyone else is taking on some of those points too. Um, so what I'll do is I'll, I'm going to put a link to your Mind Therapy um, on, the, on the page as well so people can access those resources or they can Google it. They can feel free to comment and ask some questions as well. Um, but for now, we'll say goodbye and thank you so much for, for taking part in here. Thanks so much for having me.